So um, with that, I want to introduce Amy Body, who's the uh, person's uh, whose uh, work we're really showcasing today from EMPH. Amy is an assistant professor at University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, she's in the anthropology department. And previously, she was a postdoc and assistant research professor at Arizona State University. As many of you know, her research is very broadly engaged with applying evolutionary and ecological theory to human health and disease, and very much from an interdisciplinary perspective. Um, I really enjoyed looking at her uh, webpage and all the different uh, research projects she's working on. I thought I'd just share that link in the uh, chat box as well. So, um, I've followed Amy's work for a long time. I hope you guys will start following her work as well. And today she's going to lead discussion of a paper she published with several co-authors. I think some of them are, are uh, in the uh, audience uh, today. Uh, it's a paper she published in EMPH called, with the title Lifetime Cancer Prevalence and Life History Traits in Mammals. And again, I'll post that into the chat box so you have it. Um, and she's joined by some of her co-authors on the paper. Um, I see Carlo Maley at least, and I think a few others as well. Uh, this paper covers a topic that has long been of interest, but has really seen a resurgence. And the basic question is what drives variation in cancer risk across species? And very importantly, what can we learn from that? Um, I love the comparative biology of this paper. I love the interdisciplinary approach, uh, including you know, working with uh, veterinary records um, and veterinarians. And I love the rigor uh, of the science that's involved in that. And I also like this paper because it sparked a lot of interest from our readership almost immediately. Um, and in that regard, we're going to hear from two other scientists who have written correspondence pieces related to this work that really extended in some interesting directions. So after Amy presents her work, we'll open it up for just a few clarifying questions. And then we're going to hear from Gunter Wagner from Yale, uh, who wrote one of these correspondence pieces, and then David Haig from Harvard, who wrote uh, another piece on the correspondence itself. Uh, and then we'll open things up again for more general um, discussion. And I'll put a link to those correspondence pieces in the chat box so you have them. Hopefully that went out. Okay, so I think I covered everything. I know that was a longer introduction than usual, but I wanted to you know, really highlight the, uh, the journal and uh, our excitement about this kind of work and this kind of conversation that work uh, in the journal sparks and try to showcase some of that. So I'll turn things over to you, Amy. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, let me share my screen. And then All right, everyone see the slides? Got a thumbs up? Okay. So thank you, Charlie and Meredith, for putting this together. I'm really excited to chat with everyone today. And again, this is a, a little unique because we're going to I'm going to present the data and um, you guys can ask some questions and then we're going to have some counterpoints and discussion. And um, it's really funny because I was thinking this morning, um, this particular paper and collaboration actually came out of a response from the first article um, that was published in JAMA um, in 2015 about elephants and P53 and cancer. And we started collaborating with the San Diego Zoo after that. So yay for constructive science. And so, um, okay. Um, yeah, and so as Charlie talked about, um, today I'm gonna talk about um, the variation in cancer and specifically we're gonna um, focus on mammals, but I wanted to open up big picture and get everyone on the same page in that um, uh, most mul multicellular organisms are, are vulnerable to cancer. Uh, we see it in insects and um, plants and of course in vertebrates. And so cancer really is this um, consequence of multicellular um, evolution and it has been a, a persistent selective pressure in organismal evolution. It's been around for a very long time um, and we can ask these questions. 
such as why are some species better at suppressing cancer than others? If it is ev evolutionary ancient, why haven't all species just gotten really good at um, suppressing cancer? Um, I guess we could argue, yes, they are quite, we're, we're all quite good at suppressing cancer, but we still see this vulnerability to cancer that varies across the tree of life. And, and why is that? Um, I have background in training in life history theory, and we um, we propose that maybe some um, of this variation in cancer vulnerability is due to life history trade-offs. And that is if an organism has uh, finite resources, it divides between potentially reproduction and growth and somatic maintenance. And, and these, are, these are all costly functions. And so if you're investing heavily in one, in this example, I'm saying reproduction, then you have to take away from, from, from something else. Um, in this example, we're looking at taking away from somatic maintenance. And then to get everyone on the same page again, um, we essentially can think of cancer defense mechanisms also is a major component of somatic maintenance. Um, it's included in DNA repair, um, cell cycle control, and immune function. These are all uh, cancer defense mechanisms and um, they're costly and we'd expect trade-offs. Um, and so within this framework, we can actually use life history to predict which animals would be more vulnerable to cancer. Um, we can think of life history um, strategies on a continuum from, you know, fat, live fast, die young. Um, and we'd expect these organisms to actually not evolve many cancer defense mechanisms. They're going to invest in reproduction. Um, they have low survival in many offspring. For on the other side of the life history continuum, we have these very slow, long-lived animals, and they invest heavily in somatic maintenance, and we'd expect them to have heightened cancer defense mechanisms. And that's essentially what is PETA's paradox, which is known in the cancer and evolutionary medicine world, um, whereas, um, and sorry, I'll, I'll explain this. Uh, this is cancer prevalence over here on the y-axis, and then lifespan and body mass on the x, and what Peter's paradox um, really essentially is, is saying, well, have elephants, whales, any slow, long, uh, very large organisms have many more cells than humans. Um, so all else being equal, if we're just thinking about somatic mutations that lead to cancer, elephants, whales, all of these very big organisms that have many cells, have increased risk um, because they just have more cells. We'd expect these organisms to actually have much more cancer than humans, but that's not what we see. So an expected cancer rate, but that's not what we observe. And that's PETO's paradox, that we don't observe elephants and whales and, and other very big long lived organisms getting so much cancer than, than humans. And so we suggest that this, this difference, um, bringing these observed cancer rates down, um, is that these big long lived organisms have more cancer defense me mechanisms. Um, seen with um, work and duplicates of a really important tumor suppressor gene called TP53, um, there's also duplications in, in other genes as well. within elephants. Uh, sorry if I didn't make that clear. Um, okay, and so um, back to, to, that's the background. Um, so what are we doing in this study? We're asking if these life history parameters can predict cancer risk. Um, we can retest the question, do bigger, longer lived animals get more cancer? And I just wanna put um, a caveat and um, address this. There's, there was big, uh, uh, media over the, the last paper that came out with cancer rates across organisms saying that elephants don't get cancer. That's again, not what PETA's paradox or life history is explaining. They do get cancer. They just get less than expected for the number of cells that they have in their body, okay? 
Um, and so following up from actually that JAMA 2015 paper, um, we um, increased the data set. So we were looking at um, animals that uh, were housed at the San Diego Zoo in the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Um, and it was a post-mortem data set that we, we collected. Um, we have 42 years of, of data in over 850 necropsies. There's 37 mammals we're able to uh, collect data on and it re represented over 11 mammalian orders. And what's really, really nice and amazing about this data set is um, there's complete post-mortem examinations, pathology, uh, all the tissues. It was really great to have a pathologist join the team at this point. Um, they were able to um, get a little more detail um, than what was previously published. Um, we could diagnose malignancy and benign tumors in this set. Um, and that way we were able to estimate both neoplasia prevalence and malignancy. Um, and just some background for those of you that are not within the cancer field, when I say neoplasm, this is a general term for abnormal growth. It includes both benign tumors and malignant tumors. Um, and then when we're talking about malignancy, that's cancer, right? So that's the malignant cells are actually invading the nearby tissue. And so in this um, data, I will show you both um, the rates for, for neoplasia, but then I'll just focus on malignancy for, for both. The trends are the same for everything, but I'm just going to show you the malignancy data. Um, and so here's the data right here, and I'll, I'll, I'm going over this quickly. I'll show you some more detailed slides. Um, but what we have after we, um, we had to have at least 10 individuals per species. So this is actually 29 mammals. Um, there was quite a variation in uh, neoplasia prevalence. Uh, some, some animals recorded zero and up to 61%. Um, the total data set, we had about 12% uh, neoplasia reported within the postmortem sample. And then just slightly different numbers for those that were actually cancer and malignant. Um, that ranged again from 0% to about 54% um, with the mean malignancy prevalence of about 9%. Um, one of the animals that got the most malignancy and neoplasia was the Virginia opossum. Uh, we can revisit that uh, in the, the discussion um, okay, and so the life history data that we incorporated and wanted to test was body mass, lifespan, and litter size. Um, and I, this data set represented um, pretty good variation. Our biggest, longest lived animal in the data set was the elephant. We had data on both African and Asian elephants in, in this data. Um, the smallest and shortest lived was a striped mouse. Look at how adorable it is. Um, and then we had a bunch of species with single timbers, and it ranged all the way from, from one to, whoopsie, multiple litter sizes. Um, look at that. That's adorable. Okay. Um, so, so then we asked the question, can life history theory explain why we see these, this variation um, in cancer rates? Um, the models right here, I'd like to say that we ran a, a phylogenetically corrected uh, linear regression model to uh, correct for non-independence due to evolutionary history. So, so the data I'm showing is, a, a, is corrected. They're PGL models. And uh, we tested for body mass, lifespan, litter size. And then uh, at the end, we're going to talk about placentation. Here are the models, but I wanted to show the actual data. And, Remind you again, remember this is what's predicted with PETO's paradox with body mass and lifespan. Um, and this is the data we see, all right? So this is percent malignant here on the y-axis and then we have body mass and we find no. So we read PETO's paradox holds again in this data set. Um, of special note uh, to call out the armadillos uh, were quite low, no malignancy at all. I think there's over 60 armadillos in the postmortem data set and also moose. No, um, no reports of malignancy in, in these animals. Um, I did want to point out some of the high ones. Um, Virginia opossum, 
um, prairie dog, which uh, uh, if you look into the literature, uh, this has been uh, a common knowledge within the, the vet literature that prairie dogs do get a lot of cancer. And then the Tasmanian devils are surprising because I think some of you might know that they get transmissible facial tumors. Um, this is, and I wanted to highlight that this is a zoological data set. So these individuals were protected from the transmissible facial tumors, but we're still reporting pretty high malignancy in this organism, which um, I think is, uh, is quite interesting that they just might be vulnerable to cancer in general. Um, if we look at the relationship between lifespan and malignancy, uh, again, we don't find a relationship uh, supporting PEDOS paradox. And then we also tested for um, a relationship between litter size. And what we found was that there was a positive relationship between litter size and malignancy prevalence. Um, yeah. You might, oh, was, was there a question? I'll keep going. Um, and, and you might notice that the Virginia opossum is, is quite an outlier in their litter sizes. Uh, we did run the model without it. It just trends towards significant at, at that point. So we do need more data to retest this. Um, in the last few minutes, and then we can get into discussion, I wanted to chat about um, the most beautifully complicated organ. I know you guys are all thinking it's the placenta. Um, how does placentation and, uh, depth, uh, how is it linked to, to, to cancer rates? Um, and so many of you may not be aware that um, placenta depth varies across species. And the most invasive placenta type, uh, which is hemochorial, has many similar phenocancer. It has cellular invasion, it induces angiogenesis, um, it evades the immune system. And so what you can see here is you have the least placentation or uh, least invasive placentation type on the left. So that's cow, pig, horse, endothelial. We have mid uh, placentation type endothelial, and then the most invasive, which is hemochorial, that's humans and rodents. So we tested if there was a relationship between the depth of placentation and cancer uh, malignancy. And we found no relationship. All right. So what you see here is a percent malignant and um, the increasing invasiveness um, of, the, of the degree of placentation. Um, and we find, um, I, I really thought that there would be a signal here and, and I think we're gonna open this up for discussion on, on, on why we may not see a signal with this particular data set. So I'll, I'll put a pin in this and, and leave it for some counterpoints, but, Again, I wanna reiterate, although this is a really high quality data set, it's still quite small. And so there could be a link, we need to increase our sample size, um, or there could be some other different biological processes going on here. Um, the, the evolution of placentation is actually uh, quite messy. There's, um, it's an intense site of evolutionary conflict between uh, the mother and the baby, and um, hemochorial placentation, the, mo the deepest placentation um, across phylogeny, um, it's been estimated that that's actually the an ancestral placenta type, and that epithelial placentation, the least invasive, have evolved independently many times. Um, and so there could be more complicated things uh, in the biology going on there. And I'll leave that open um, for the discussion. Um, and so conclusion discussion point, uh, um, I'd like to, uh, we retested PETA's paradox and it holds. Uh, we don't see a relationship between um, cancer prevalence and, or I'm sorry, body size or lifespan. Um, we do find a significant relationship between cancer prevalence and litter size. This may be suggestive of some type of antagonistic pleiotropy going on here. Or um, life history traits are highly correlated, so it could just be a signal for this life history 
organism. Um, and then we didn't see a link between placenta invasiveness and animals diagnosed with neoplasia or uh, malignancy. Um, and so with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention so far. And I'm really excited to hear what David Haig and Gutner Wagner have to say and open it up for discussion in general. Okay, thank you, Amy. <laughs> I don't, should I stop sharing screen? Are we open? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to just give a couple of minutes in case anybody has any questions that are more of a clarifying type about the results that were just presented uh, before we go on to hear um, the perspectives of, of Gunter Wagner and uh, David Haig. Does anyone have, we have time for a couple of questions, does anyone have any questions related to um, details of what we just heard? So I have one hand raised and I saw a couple of clarifying questions in the chat. We'll go to the raised hand. Uh, Stephen Osted, you can go ahead with your question. Yes, I have a question about the longevity data. Um, did, mm -hmm. did you get that from uh, captive studies or from uh, wild species or from an age, which is a right. combination? It's an age and it is a combination and we're using max lifespan here. Um, so that's the data we used for this. We've talked about having a wild versus um, captive lifespan analysis. Um, we'd have to get a bigger data set, I think, to start yeah, just, teasing just that apart. On that, um, yep. you know, the animals that the husbandry is better uh, developed in zoos live long, much longer than they would in yep. the wild and are likely to get more cancer. So that's kind of a, an issue to deal with, I guess. Yes, yes, definitely. They're living longer. They get medical treatment and, and, and can, can live longer. So that's definitely an important component to looking at zoo data. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. Do you see any hands raised, Meredith? I do not. I think that addressed a lot of the clarifying questions in the chat. Uh, any other clarifying questions before we move on? Okay, let's um, go ahead and move on to Gunter. I hope you're still on, Gunter. There we go. Yeah, I am. Okay, so uh, we'll hear from uh, Gunter Wagner from Yale University. Um, I think one slide <laughs> is what we allowed him. Um, and, uh, oh, it has a lot on it, I see. <laughs> Good strategy, Gunter. Uh, take it away, Gunter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here and uh, discuss an issue that I'm really um, uh, interested in and my colleagues and I are working very hard on <laughs> the connection between cancer malignancy and, uh, and plus evolution of placenta type. And I uh, thank uh, uh, Amy for introducing different forms of placentation, so I don't have to do that. Um, and I um, also want to say before I go into the details, I really appreciate the work that uh, Amy and her uh, colleagues have been doing. It's really important to have more and more of this kind of uh, data, uh, which you know, was really almost completely absent until very recently. Um, okay, that doesn't go on. How do I go here? Okay, here we are. Okay, so here's my crowded slide. <clears throat> um, I want to do two things here. One is to explain a little bit our perspective, our, that means my colleagues and I. Um, and the starting point really is the observation that not only cancer rates are different, but actually vulnerability to malignancy are quite different between uh, species and I often uh, uh, illustrate this by this case uh, study here out of India uh, with a cow that has a uh, about one kilogram um, melanocytoma but no cancer spread which is quite different from the vulnerability of humans when you know we develop a, a melanocytoma uh, we are quite in great risk and <clears throat> the way we uh, think about these differences is that uh, malignancy is really a interaction between the tumor and the host, in particular the host uh, uh, stroma uh, 
uh, influences the likelihood of a tumor uh, becoming malignant. We have uh, tested this experimentally in this recent paper from last year, uh, where we looked at cow and uh, human fibroblasts, both from the uterus and the skin, and we could show that uh, bovine skin fibroblasts and endometrial fibroblasts are much less invasible uh, than uh, human cells. Here you see some results from um, I think those are yeah, skin fibroblasts with melanoma uh, lines and always the human uh, uh, cell type is more invasible than the, the, the bovine uh, counterpart. You may be wondering why, uh, uh, you know, the, it's also the case that, you know, cows and horses and so that are known for less malignancy uh, have this uh, less invasive presentation. And so you may be wondering why this, you know, skin fibroblasts and uterine fibroblasts have a similar biology. Uh, you know, one note that I can give you right here is that if you look at the uh, correlation of gene expression changes in these two cell types over mammalian phylogeny, you see very high correlation of gene expression changes. So in a way, uh, different fibroblasts populations and cell types actually evolve quite uh, in a correlated mesh uh, way. Here you have one particular gene that is correlation is particularly high, um, active in receptor. Now what I want to point out uh, and, um, and uh, yeah, explain why my perspective on the data that uh, Amy has published uh, is a little bit different that uh, is the following. Uh, to us, uh, malignancy is actually at least a two-step process. So we have first normal tissue, then mutations occur, uh, forming uh, a primary tumor. We may call this process tumorogenesis. And once you have a tumor, then there's another uh, uh, step, uh, name it uh, uh, malignant transformation, <clears throat> which then actually gives you the uh, spreading uh, tumor, the malignant tumor. So the biology of going from normal cells to uh, cancer cells and from cancer cells to malignant cancer cells are actually uh, quite different. And in particular, this second uh, step is one that is more uh, interaction between host tissue and the tumor. Uh, than uh, the uh, original tumorogenesis. Now, if this is a two-step uh, process, the way to uh, calculate uh, malignancy rate, uh, as I understand them, um, is to take the number of malignant tumors among uh, the uh, necropsies of a species and divide it by the number of tumors of any sort, because the malignancy rate is conditional on the uh, question of whether there is a primary tumor or not. Now, if we reanalyze um, the data from San Diego um, Zoo and as well as uh, reusing data that uh, a student of mine and I have used some years ago and you know, pull all of this together, we get a pattern that looks something like this here. Marsupials are, have a high malignancy rate for reasons that are interesting in itself. But within the placental mammals, there is sort of a suggestive trend where the least invasive um, animals with the least invasive placentation have also the lowest uh, malignancy rate as calculated in this way. Endothelial uh, estimated to be a little bit higher, although you already see that you know, p-values is not what I will uh, publish here. And hemochorial is higher than both, is est estimated to be higher than endothelial and epithelial choral. Um, so I think that overall, even though the statistical power is still limited, uh, and if we think about malignancy rate in the way I defined it up here, there is a, there's an, uh, a suggestive correlation between uh, invasive uh, in, uh, 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 hemochorial uh, placentation and high rates of malignancy uh, as defined up here, and the least one in epithelial. Uh, um, um, and I think I'm already beyond my two minutes that I was allotted and uh, probably uh, should stop here and just say that, you know, again, that I really appreciate the work that uh, Amy and colleagues have done. And, uh, that's the important step, I think. Uh, disagreements about interpretation and analysis are something that, you know, well meaning people can, uh, can discuss about. Uh, Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gunter, for that. That's really useful. And uh, so basically, there, your, your reanalysis suggests that there's an effect, there may be an effect of placentation. Okay. But it, it really depends on how you estimate uh, a rate. So uh, Amy actually uh, uh, estimated it by number from different tools, divided by number of microbes. Yeah. I would argue actually uh, confound malignancy to neurogenesis to, to put these two processes together. So okay. That's, that's the, the way I, I okay. argue. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll now move on to David Haig. David, are you still with us? There he is. We have next David Haig, uh, professor at Harvard. And you have a slide for us. I do have a slide, so let me try and. Um, oh, you have share. several. Well, actually, can I um, can I talk just a little bit before I uh, share share the screen? So, of course, I would love to talk a lot about um, placentas and um, maternal resistance to placental invasion. But what I want to focus my attention on is um, is issues of litter size. Um, first of all, I applaud um, the analysis of body and colleagues. Um, but, you know, one of the costs of large data analyses is that they've got to make um, decisions on how do you measure litter size and things like that, that are ignoring a lot of um, fascinating um, biology. And I was particularly fascinated in their um, data set that um, one of the biggest correlations of cancer rate was litter size. Um, I find that um, quite an attractive correlation because the degree of um, both maternal paternal conflict in placental development the, and the um, maternal offspring co conflict tends to go up as you have multiple offspring competing for resources at the same time. So I might um, expect that um, litter size would be, so large litters would be correlated with um, cancer. Now, an interesting observation there then is that two of the very high cancer rates in marsupials are in Virginia opossums and in um, Tasmanian devils. And in both those cases, the litter size that was used was the number of offspring recorded in the pouch. And in both those species, in fact, the number of offspring in the pouch is considerably smaller than the litter size in the uterus. In the case of Virginia opossums, it can be up to 50 embryos at a time um, that are scrambling to attach to 11 teats within the pouch. Um, the data on Tasmanian devils is um, much um, less, in, there's less data on Tasmanian devils, but Tasmanian devils do produce more offspring than there is a uh, nipple to attach to. And so there's a very rapid scramble um, to get into the pouch after birth. And so if you look in those um, marsupials, their entry to the pouch is very, very rapid indeed. There's intense um, selection to be one of the ones that gets there. The ones that don't attach to a teat are often eaten by the mother or discarded in some other way. By contrast, kangaroos only produce a single offspring at a time for one teat, and, and there they have a much slower um, crawl into the pouch with the mother inspecting them the um, whole way. So perhaps the um, Virginia opossum, if you were using um, litter size in utero, would not be such an outlier and would strengthen the association um, with litter size. The other thing that struck me in the data was the, the data on the armadillos, which were given a litter size of um, four, but had a very low um, cancer rate. And that fascinated me for reasons that I will go into in a, in a moment. Um, so people who know me know I'm obsessed with um, squabbling among offspring and um, conflicts. And a lot of mammals have um, bicornuate uterine. These, um, if you've ever dissected a pregnant rat, um, each of the um, embryos is in its own implantation um, chamber. And I think that's partly an adaptation to keep the kids apart and to keep them squabbling um, in utero, that they tend to be isolated um, from each other. Um, there are exceptions. The pronghorn is sitting there. 
Uh, it was given a litter size of two, but in fact, in pronghorns, there are, they start off with about six or seven embryos in each side, and all but one of them gets killed in early competition, and then that's how a, a mother gives birth to um, twins. Now, back to armadillos. Uh, armadillos are fascinating um, because, well, they have ancestors that give birth to a single offspring at a time. And so they evolved a simplex uterus, which doesn't have two horns. So there's no way to keep the kids apart in um, utero. And then they've subsequently evolved a um, litter. The only other case I know of in mammal phylogeny where that's occurred is in um, marmosets. Um, so they come from primate ancestors that produce a singleton and now they're producing a litter of two, or in some cases, three. So now I want to try and share my um, screen. Okay, so, so this is a picture of a um, armadillo uterus. Um, if you can see the pointer, the ovaries are down here and the fallopian tubes leading into the simplex uterus. Um, and Dasypus novum cinctus, the nine-banded armadillo, produces a litter of four. But interestingly, those litters are always four males or four females. And the reason why this is so is that they're only, they're a monozygotic litter. These are monozygotic quadruplets. So here are a couple of pictures in different stages of pregnancy. They have a single placenta with four umbilical cords. So in this case, there's no competition within the litter for maternal resources because all the members of the litter are um, genetically identical individuals. So in genetic terms, this is not a litter size of four, but a litter size of one. And so it would be interesting to put it into the analysis um, there. And so it would not be such an outlier on the um, litter size um, association. Just because I love them, now a little bit about uh, marmosets. Um, so marmosets are color-tricked um, monkeys, um, golden lion tamarind here. Um, when I used to have red hair, a pair of these went berserk at me in a zoo. Um, I, I was a supernormal stimulus, I think. So marmosets have a simplex uterus and they give birth to twins. But unlike, um, unlike the armadillos where it's a mo monozygotic litter, um, marmoset twins are dizygotic from different um, fertilized eggs. So here is a simplex uterus of a marmoset. And what happens in marmoset placentation is that the placentas fuse and their blood, they develop a common blood supply within the um, uterus. And so each marmoset is a bone marrow chimera of its co-twin. And that means 50% of marmosets in um, the wild have both XX male cells and XY female cells circulating in their um, bloodstream. Um, there are a lot of fascinating questions that I would love to go into if we had time and questions. Um, so, and here, here is an example of triplets with a fused, um, fused placenta. This triplet has died. Um, here we have twins where one of the embryos has died and the mother's giving birth to a singleton. In these cases, we know that the surviving offspring is actually um, Contain, carrying cells in its bodies from its, um, from its uh, deceased um, siblings. So um, I don't, didn't notice that marmosets were standing out as particularly unusual, but they are one of my favorite um, organisms. And with that, I will stop um, my presentation. Great, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, I wanted to just turn things over to Amy Boddy and, and some of her uh, co-authors just to see if they had anything they wanted to say and then we'll open it up for uh, discussion. Uh, anything you'd like to say, Amy, or other co-authors on the paper? Yeah, I mean, does anyone else want to say anything? Um, one of the things I wanted to follow up on is thank you, David and Gutner, but thank you, David, for 
I had no idea of the intense conflict in utero uh, for some of these species, and I'd, I'd be interested in getting a larger data set and analyzing cancer rates um, amongst these and having these really cool experiments in nature where the, you know, maybe six sister taxa that don't have that and, and, and looking at that. Um, for Gutner, uh, I wondered if we could expand a little bit more on this, this idea. Um, so you presented this idea that um, when you look at just animals that have developed tumors, which ones that go on to progress to malignancy. So we're talking about the, the, this transformation in biology from a benign to a more ma malignant tumor. Right now, we're, 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 this is new data, and we're crudely calling all cancer, we're lumping all cancer that could be derived from different tissue types into the analysis. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit more on if you would actually predict that once we start teasing apart um, the different cancer types, because maybe maybe we're not seeing a signal with the placentation, um, because we're 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 actually a little crude with throwing all all cancer types in there. If we remove lymphoma or or, or uh, cancers derived not from epithelial tissue, would we would we see something else? So yeah. So so uh, in am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Um, yeah. So uh, you may remember that the paper with De Sousa in 2014, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, veterinary uh, records on uh, cows, horses, cats, and uh, dogs, um, and there they actually classified. There was enough data out there uh, to sub uh, categorize different cancers, and uh, in, in fact, we found one of their categories there was no species differences. Uh, and uh, and in three of their categories that were the species differences or the correlation with the presentation type. So certainly there are, um, the, we would expect uh, different biologies in different parts of the body. Um, and uh, for instance, also, you know, uh, brain tum tumors are uh, malignant and they kill the patient, but are not technically metastatic. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, sort of subtleties in, in that respect, and uh, you know, I, I completely agree that the, all of these uh, uh, distinctions are only um, we can act on them only if we have much larger data sets, because otherwise we have just you know singleton observations. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, I, I, so that is uh, that is certainly the case that we need more and more uh, comparative data, and I hope I also see some of the comments here that say people are working on data sets and I'm really excited to see more of the data coming. Yeah, there have been a great number of uh, comments and questions in the chat box. Um, before we turn to some of those questions, Carlo, I see your hand is up. Uh, you're one of uh, the co-authors. Did you have something you wanted to uh, contribute to the conversation? Or Athena? Yeah, just yeah, Athena, also a co-author. Um, uh, just a, actually a quick shout out to Gunter and colleagues. Um, it, we really appreciated them bringing up this additional analysis of that proportion of neoplasms that trans, uh, transform into malignancy. I wouldn't even characterize it as a disagreement about how to analyze. It was just we hadn't done that, and it's great that they saw that, and there's a possible pattern there. So we're really, uh, really glad that you brought that up. Thank you. Actually, I have a, a question for David, if I may, uh, before we go on. Uh, Charlie? Yeah, David, you there? Okay, yeah, go ahead. So, I, so uh, I, I missed in your comment uh, and also in your, your presentation, uh, the rationale of why you expect higher cancer rates with larger litter sizes. Can you expand on this a little bit? So the, the argument there is that um, it's sort of compatible with your sort of arguments that, um, that, that placentation, extraction of resources from um, mothers is a domain of conflict. And it's both a conflict in traditional parent offspring conflict between maternal tissues, decidua, and the placenta, but also within the offspring genome between um, maternal and paternally derived um, genes. So this is the subject of genomic imprinting, um, where we, 
which we know has a very important role in the um, placenta. Um, and when you have a, when you have a singleton, um, the, the competition is only to um, existing offspring or future offspring, whereas when you produce um, litters, um, there's, there's ongoing conflict within the uterus. As I've said, in rats and things, they tend to keep the kids apart, but there's still a scramble competition for extracting resources from mothers. And so you tend to have a correlation of um, really quite altricial offspring born after re relatively short gestations with, um, with larger um, litter sizes. And so I think that um, that nexus of character states is partly related to these um, intragenomic and intergenerational um, conflicts. And it's interesting then that in armadillos, um, which you know are probing the rule that you've got a litter, but there's no, but they are genetically a, a singleton that they appear um, to be um, different. I mean, I understand the com uh, the comp competition part. But how does this react uh, uh, <laughs> connect to cancer rates? That's I, I still don't understand. Sorry so to... let's let's pass that, and if we have time, it's a long discussion. I, I see Athena has her hand raised. I can answer yeah. that one. Yeah. Go so, ahead. um, so the way I see it, the best, clearest example of how this could um, relate to cancer rates is that when you do have this competition over the maternal resources, you have paternal genes that are upregulating resource transfer and growth rate of the offspring and maternal genes that are downregulating that. And so you end up having this sort of battle happening like within the genome over growth rate. And if anything gets messed up in that, um, it's quite possible that you end up with growth rates that are much higher than would even be optimal for the organism. So to me, that's the, the clearest spot where a genetic conflict kind of intersects with potentially increasing cancer risk. And I thought it was a um, fascinating parallel that you were drawing, David, about you know, considering the genetic relatedness within the litters as a factor. I think that would, that would be really cool because it would help distinguish about, you know, whether it's genetic conflict that's driving the cancer rates or if it's something else about litter size as a life history characteristic that is influencing the cancer rate. Right. Even this, like, extreme competition for the, the embryos to get to the teats for the Virginia opossum could be, like, selecting for, like, get big as quickly as possible, don't care about anything else, you know, you have to be the one that survives, and that could be a trade-off with cancer defenses, getting, getting to that, so... This, this is a fascinating uh, conversation. We're only going to have time for a couple more questions, and so I just want to move on uh, to ask Mick if he's still here, if he would like to ask his question, Mick Elliott. You've had your hand up for a very long time. It must be getting tired. And so uh, please ask your question if you're here. And if anyone else has a question, please raise your hand and we'll try to fit in one more. Maybe he gave up on us. <laughs> Mick, we can't hear you if you are trying to speak. Okay, maybe he stepped away. Um, there are so many questions in the chat box. I don't even know where he, to begin. He's here. He's here, just having trouble getting the sound. Yeah, but we can't hear you. Uh, maybe if you oh, reach your question one more time, and I'll I'll ask it since we're having mic issues for you. I know you've had a few questions in the chat, so I don't know which one you're dying to hear an answer about. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, does anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask verbally? raise your hand if so. All right, well, I'll pull a question from the chat in the meantime. Um, so we had a question from Rishabh Kapoor. Given the finding that elephants have a higher copy number of T53, is there any evidence that T53 copy number correlates inversely with litter size? Uh, oh, I, go um, so right now, elephants are one of the only species that we see. Wait, Lisa, you might be better at, this I, is first author on the elephant that, discovery, yeah. so you, you answer that. I just answered on the, on the chat and what Amy was saying is right. So we've only discovered really high copy numbers so far in the elephant, um, but 
enhanced TP53 activity can occur in the absence of an increase in copy number. So we need to do some functional studies on TP53 activity across species before we could do any correlative studies. Great, thank you for that. Okay, Mick, are, we, uh, are you up and running and able to ask the question or do you wanna type it in or? Okay, so we got the question in the chat. Thanks, Mick. Uh, so still typing, but so far we have um, unclear on the cancer placenta connection. We know that genetic circuits in cancer are derived from genes involved in the cell cycle and the cell cycle evolved before placentas. So cancer must, must arise before placentas. We're waiting on the second part of the thought. Any uh, thoughts on that so far about the kind of the timeline of placentation I mean, versus cancer? I mean, I mean the, the main point and that it gets missed by many people is that the placenta connection only concerns malignancy, transform, malignant transformation, not cancer rates per se. So cancer rates, I, at least I never made a claim that cancer rate is related to uh, uh, the placentation type. But the, the connection that we see and also experimentally have shown is with uh, invasibility, meaning the, the uh, stronger or weaker resistance of the stroma to the invasion by the uh, by tumor or by trophoblast cells, the, the placental cells. So, so it is about malignancy as malignant transformation, not cancer rate per se. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and say a little uh, there. Can you hear me? Good. Um, the, so, uh, Nick's absolutely right that, um, that the cell cycle is a lot, lot older than um, placentation, and it's a lot, lot older than genomic imprinting. And interestingly, genomic imprinting and placentation come into the evolutionary record at the same time. It would be really, really great to have some good comparative data on rates of cancer in mammals, um, which particularly um, marsupials and eutherians have placental developments and in other vertebrates. And it would be great to have as high quality data as in Amy's paper for, for non-mammalian um, vertebrates. But the control of cell cycle can be old and yet it uniquely becomes subject to genomic imprinting in mammalian development. And as one example of that, CDKN1C, which is a cyclin-dependent kinase um, inhibitor, so it's an inhibitor of progression through the cell cycle, is maternally expressed and paternally is silent in mammalian development. So that um, now rather than, so CDKN1C is a tumor suppressor gene, but now one of the copies is inactivated by imprinting. So the placental connection is saying that once you have placentation, you start to have disagreements between genes of maternal and paternal origin on rates of proliferation. And because of that disagreement, it starts to undermine cancer defenses. And I think it's no coincidence, this is going back for, for a century now, the, you see a lot of placental specific genes expressed in um, cancers. Chorionic gonadotropin, for example, is frequently expressed in cancers and is often um, used as a, um, as, a, as, a, as a marker of cancer. Back in the 19th century, in fact, um, the, the, um, um, the nature of the placentation was invasive was actually figured out by the study of choriocarcinomas um, which are placental derived tumors that are highly invasive. They're an interesting tumor in that they derive from the offspring from the placenta, but they invade in a lethal in the, the mother's um, body. And so they are one of the most metastatic of all um, cancers described in humans. Okay, I hate to interrupt this great uh, discussion that we're having, but we are at the top of the hour. I want to point out that Mick did complete his uh, question. There had already been some answers uh, to the question and further feedback. I have to say this has really been a fantastic uh, club I've met, a really good example of what we're looking for with the kind of dialogue and 
and different perspectives uh, that are being shared here today. So thank you very much, Amy. Thank you, Gunter. Uh, thank you, David. I should have pointed out that uh, Gunter had some co-authors on his uh, correspondence. And uh, I want to thank Amy's uh, co-authors for, for coming and, and weighing in as well. Um, the last thing I want to do is share with you the upcoming Club of Meds, if I can share my screen, uh, which hopefully you're seeing here. Uh, next week, we have uh, a, some uh, interesting, perhaps related topics, an evolutionary lens on analyzing human birth timing. Uh, we're going to hear from Abby LaBella, uh, Abin Abraham, Lou Muglia, and Tonis Rokas, and Tony Capra about some of the work that they have uh, coming out uh, and have already published. Uh, after that, we have Dan Lieberman. Uh, he's going to be talking about his new book, uh, which is titled Exercise, Why Something We Never Evolved to Do is Healthy and Rewarding. Great cover, isn't it? There, that's pretty cool. And then after that, September 24th, we have our uh, student spotlight. We're going to showcase three graduate students doing really cutting edge work in evolutionary medicine. Um, and I won't go on, but you can go to the website yourself and see what else is coming up. This was a great conversation. Thank you all very much for participating. Thanks for joining us. I'm sorry we didn't have more time for conversation. And I really hope to see you guys again at Future Club of Meds. So, thank you. Thanks for organizing it. Thank you. Thanks, Gunther.